Several years ago, I'm speaking to a group of college freshmen, and a young woman raises her hand and says, all my life, I've dreamt of becoming a singer. It's what I've been building toward, it's what everyone wants for me, but I'm starting to feel like it might not be right, and like there might be something else, but I don't know what that is. And, and if I'm not becoming my dream of being a singer, then I literally don't know who I am. And that feels like a failure. And I'm thinking, great. Uh, not great that she feels like a failure, but I know that on the other side of that doubt is a path that's more aligned and probably even bigger than what she had originally imagined. So I'm about to say this to her, and then she says, so what did you do? You gave up on your dream, and you seem like you're doing pretty great. You're so peppy. <laughs> and you know these moments when someone says something that's like a direct shot to the tenderest place in your heart, and you're flooded with an avalanche of thoughts and feelings in the moment, and your face is getting all hot and red. But big emotions don't really have a place in our culture unless you're a toddler. So what you end up saying is, what a great question. <laughs> And then I'm feeling really discombobulated in the moment. And then I say the thing that absolutely no one wants to hear when they're in the middle of a challenging transition, which is, you know, it just takes time. Not one of my proudest teaching moments. But I discovered something that day. Even though I had been helping people with their creativity and paths for years at that point, I still hadn't fully dealt with mine. And Unconsciously, I was bringing something into the room with me that day. We talk a lot about baggage, relationship baggage, money baggage, but I've noticed we also carry dream baggage. No one tells us what to do with our old dreams, so we just put them in a box inside of ourselves that we take with us everywhere we go. And two things became clear for me that day. And the first is that our current model for dreaming the one we reinforce with motivational stories and inspirational messages isn't actually working for everyone. And secondly, I needed to do something about that box. We need our dreams. Dreams build worlds. They galvanize communities. They bridge the gap between the possible and the impossible. We're here today to talk about one step forward, and dreams can be both the compass and the engine for taking that step. But, of course, you know this. Perhaps you've already seen an Instagram post today telling you to go for your dream. But has anyone ever said to you it's okay to let go of a dream or have some boundaries with it? This is the story we don't talk about as much. Culturally, we love the journey of the person who has one big dream, who sacrifices everything and does whatever it takes to accomplish it. It's a beautiful story and it's responsible for some of our most exciting moments in history. But something that I've learned in the thousands of conversations I've gotten to have with people at all stages of their journey is that this pressure to stick with one dream at all costs can sometimes stand in the way of our most prolific development and creative expression and it can bring an unnecessary shame and unworthiness. I believe we need to dream bigger about how we're dreaming. We need a new framework, one that allows us to maintain the visionary nature of being human, but that brings us home to ourselves instead of yet another reminder that we're not measuring up. Because the messaging reinforces that achieving our dream will bring us worth and status and happiness which also tells us that we better not stop until we get there, and until we get there, we'll never be enough. What if a dream is a big, meaningful project, a vehicle to take us through the next stage of our evolution instead of yet another reminder that the wholeness lives outside of ourselves? What if our dreams don't define us? My very first dream was to become a cat, a ballerina, and a lady boss named Sally Kimball. My name is Elizabeth, but I thought that was a terrible name for a lady boss. So when I was four, I started calling my parents by their first names, and I renamed myself Sally. But I had a pronounced lisp at the time, so it came out like Sally Kimball. 
But we're told we have to choose one dream. And since I didn't know of any early childhood schools for CEOs, and becoming a cat felt a little logistically challenging, I took my first ballet class when I was seven, and I fell in love and quickly obsessed. I would wake up early to stretch. I would stay late at the studio to practice. Ballet became what consumed my thoughts all day long. I spent my summers training when everyone else was outside. And ballet also became my home and my identity. When people would introduce me, they would say, this is Liz, she's the dancer, which would make me feel really special because once we reach a certain place in our development, we love not only the thing that we're doing, but we love how other people see us doing it. After over a decade of intense dedication, I was offered a scholarship to one of the top programs in the country, and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't more excited about it. But I was determined <laughs> to ignore that feeling because giving up was absolutely not a part of the plan. I had actually been having doubts for a while. I was becoming increasingly curious about other creative expressions, and I was starting to become worried about the person that I was becoming as I was going after this passion. I had multiple injuries, a serious eating disorder, debilitating insecurity, and an incredibly cruel and demanding inner voice, which I now call the tiny terrorist who lives inside of my head. But at that time, I thought that was just me being really dedicated to my dream. So it's almost midnight on the night I'm supposed to make my decision. And I'm about to give the yes that's going to make my whole life make sense. And all of a sudden, I hear a new voice. And this voice is kind but firm. And it says, don't do it. I look over at my dad. He's there to help me with the decision. I'm terrified of letting him down. And I'm about to ask him what he thinks I should do when I realize that he is fast asleep. So the decision is mine to make. I take a breath. I feel the fear rise through my chest and into my throat. And I say no to the thing that I and everyone else think I'm supposed to do with my life. So what would sound really spectacular at this point in the talk would be if I were to tell you that from that moment forward, my entire life changed. The clouds parted. I immediately catapulted into a permanent state of bliss. And I was just crushing it 24 hours a day. But that before and after transformation story is similar to the go for your dream narrative. It sounds impressive in a commercial or a social media post, but it's not always what, it likes, what it's like to be human. Real change is messy and non-linear, and that doesn't mean that we're doing it wrong. I went on to have a fulfilling professional life that continues to unfold in ways I truly could never have imagined. But no matter how much success or progress I experienced, I kept lugging this box everywhere, and it was awkward. What I thought was inside of it was the secret that I didn't want anyone to know that I had given up, that I had failed myself and everyone who bet on me. Several years ago, I found a commencement speech by scholar and theologian Howard Thurman. And these words really helped me understand the decision that I made that night. Thurman says that the most important guide that we'll have in our lifetime is the sound of the genuine in ourselves. And if we can't hear it, he says, we will spend all of our life on the, days of, on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. I shared th these words in an article once, and a woman emails me back, and she says, Liz, that sounds amazing, but like, how do you hear it? I don't even think I know what my genuine sounds like. I get it. We're living in a culture that not only depends upon, but actually profits off of our not trusting the sound of our own voice. We're told to buy the product, and that's going to make us happy, or follow the guru, and that will make us successful. We're inundated with the idea that the answer to our wholeness lives outside of ourselves, that people with more power than us somehow know better than we do what we need. When we're very little, our choices and our visions are sourced nearly entirely from within. Sally Kimball was not worried about what other people thought of her. But as we grow, our dreams become influenced by the world that we live in. And we can easily start organizing our life around shoulds, 
which are like dreams that don't belong to us, or dreams that have grown too small for us. So here's what I wish I had said to that brave young woman in my workshop who raised her hand that day, and what I'd love to leave you with today. The sound of your genuine is not failure. It's not giving up. Listening to it is one of the most courageous choices you can make for your life and for the world you live in. Sometimes it says keep going when everything feels really difficult. And sometimes it whispers go left, even though everything else in your life has been pointing to the right. And this left turn can feel terrifying, but this left turn is responsible for some of our most creative and human work in our collective history. We have to trust that the fear we're feeling is actually a sign of progress, like a marker on the path telling us to keep going in that direction. And it's okay not to have all the answers. Our answers-driven culture doesn't leave us much time and space to be with the questions. But questions are the birthplace of possibility. And when we let go of one path, we really want to be able to confirm that the new one we're on is going to be a guaranteed success. But when you have the courage to listen to the sound of your genuine, most days can feel more like bushwhacking than a jaunty hike in the woods. And lastly, if no one has ever said this to you before, I give you permission to let go of a dream that is no longer serving you, or to allow your current dream to expand or shift beyond what you had originally imagined. And then, whenever you feel ready, tell your story. We need stories about left turns and dream evolutions as much as we need the linear stories about going for it at all costs. So, I finally decided to open up the box. And I braced myself for shame and regret that I was certain was in here. And there was grief and sadness, but I discovered something else that I had forgotten about. Inside of the box, I remembered the little girl who loved to dance for hours in the living room. Her wild creativity, her surprising boldness, her weird curiosities. And I realized that what I thought had been a failure that I was lugging around with me all of these years was actually like a light, a spark that I had tucked away and that was more powerful than any one accomplishment or anybody else's formula for success. People say to me all the time, Liz, I just want to find my purpose. What if it's already here? What if our purpose is a collection of curiosities, a set of questions and themes that are entirely unique to each of us. And dreams and goals are like the pathways for exploring that curiosity and expressing that original spark for as long as they're helping us grow. Then when our purpose isn't confined to a single endeavor or identity, we can take it with us wherever we go. Because the spark is not something to be achieved. It can't be taken away from us and it's always within us. And when we can free it in ourselves, we can more clearly see it and celebrate it in each other. And the world needs more original sparks. We just have to open up the box. Thank you so much.